Uh, years ago, I was a I was a professor um, on a, a, a on the faculty of a different seminary, and I won't I won't mention the name, but its initials are were Westminster Theological Seminary. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, in Philadelphia, and uh, there, deep in the bowels of the um, of the seminary, there were a lot. <clears throat> back then, before the internet, there was an awful lot of stuff that you could only find in libraries. <laughs> I found a bunch of sermons by a guy named Robert Murray McShane that had never been published. They still actually haven't been published. <clears throat> At least they they've been out of print for you know 100 years or so. And he was a a Scottish minister, um, 1830s or something like that, 1840s, something like that. Uh, and he, he wrote a sermon, which, by the way, you can, I, I checked last night. You actually can find it on the Internet now. But he wrote a sermon <clears throat> on this text. This is 1 Samuel 3, 19 to 21. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and God let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was a prophet of the Lord, the Lord revealed himself to Samuel through his word, and Samuel's word came to all Israel. Right. The Lord was with Samuel, and God let none of his words fall to the ground. Uh, McShane says a lot of interesting stuff about that. It, I have not forgotten it. It was, you know, I read it 40 years ago or so. Um, for some of you, it looks like that was a very long time ago. <laughs> uh, for some of the rest of us, it looks like it wasn't all that long ago. But anyway... Um, it, it stayed with me, and I'll get, let me give you the gist of it, not just uh, recapitulate, but just the gist of it. I'll start this way. If you're in any kind of ministry at all, you've basically got one task, to bring the Word of God into contact with their hearts. This is true whether you're a counselor. This is true whether you're a campus minister. This is true whether you're a, a preacher. You know, it's to get the Word of God into contact with the heart, which means you need to know two things to do ministry. The one is you got to understand the human heart. Actually, I would say there's two parts to that. The one is you've got to know what the Bible says is true of every human heart absolutely everywhere. Uh, and the Bible does tell us that there are some things that are true of all human beings. It doesn't matter their race, their gender, what century, what culture, it's true of all of them. But then there are also some things that are uh, particular to every culture. And you'll, you, uh, you really won't understand a particular human heart unless you both understand what makes it different than other human hearts because of the culture, but also what makes it exactly the same because they're all in the image of God and have all fallen in, into sin. So you have to understand the human heart. Now, in your Master of Arts program, in a theological program like the MA that's, uh, standing bef that's that we are uh, uh, presenting here, you actually do learn about the human heart. Um, there's one course on the culture which I teach in the, in the, uh, the two years, which is trying to get at, well, what is it like to uh, work on with people in modern Western culture and what does culture have to do? Uh, when in systematic theology, especially certain parts of the theology, you will definitely be saying, what does the Bible say about all human beings? What is true of all human beings? So the heart is addressed in the MA. The other thing you've got to know to do ministry, besides the human heart, obviously, is the Word of God. You've got to understand the Word of God inside out. And fittingly, that's the main thing the MA program is going to be talking to you about. Now, when I use the word inside out, I know that just sounds like rhetoric, but I, I actually, I, I mean it very literally. First of all, you need to know it inside out in the sense of you need to understand the Scripture itself inside out, not just your favorite parts not just uh, you know, a set of stories, you have to understand how it fits together. You have to understand uh, the warp and woof of it. You have to understand all the various topics. That, that's, that's one way. You have to understand the themes. You have to understand it inside out. But it's also true that you have to understand it inside out, meaning it can't just be head knowledge, and that's kind of what Sam was talking about here. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued. I've always been, every year when I get through reading through the Bible, I always get to Ezekiel 2 and 3, and it's fascinating that in Ezekiel 2, God shows Ezekiel a scroll. He's calling Ezekiel to be a prophet here. He see, shows him a scroll, and on the scroll, there's all sorts of uh, sad things, you know, woeful things, uh, uh, hard things on the scroll, which means in the Word of God, there's, there's words of judgment. There's words that are very hard to hear. But then in Ezekiel 3, he says, eat the scroll, um, which metaphorically is also something that 
people who minister are supposed to be doing, digesting the Word of God. But, but it said, it's interesting, Ezekiel says it was sweet to his taste. Now, why would something that was filled with, you know, hard things be sweet? It means that even though you might admonish people with tears, and I hope you do, whenever you have to tell people bad news, you know, part of the gospel is the bad news as well as the good news, that though you don't enjoy it, nevertheless, you so love the God of the Word, the Lord of the Word, that in a sense you sympathize with everything God says. It, it, it becomes part of you. It's really inside you. Uh, you love what God loves and you hate what God hates. That's the, so the Word of God isn't just something outside, it's really something inside. And uh, So you have to understand the Word inside out and you have to understand the human heart. You have to understand the Word accurately. You have to know what the Word of God is actually saying, and then you have to speak it fittingly. And then when you know it accurately and you speak it fittingly, that is to say you understand the Word accurately and you bring it home to the heart fittingly in a way that people can hear and understand, powerful things happen. Now, I think that's... McShane would say that's behind this really fascinating statement where it says, the Lord was with Samuel and none of his words fell to the ground. They all had power. Uh, you know, you do a little bit of Hebrew looking there. What it, what it's, a, it's an image that none of the words fall to the ground. What it really meant was they all had an effect. They all had an impact. They didn't just go out in the air and evaporate. Why? Because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel through his word, and Samuel's word came to all Israel. Now, McShane says, does this mean <clears throat> that this promise is true for us as people who are trying to minister the word. Is, is, that, is this a promise that we can say that uh, we also can be sure that none of our words will ever fall to the ground? Now, I, I want to tell you as a minister, and I have spoken a lot of words in 40 years or more, and I want you to know some of my words absolutely have fallen to the ground. <laughs> I want you to know that. I've said intemperate things. I've said insensitive things. I've just said unbalanced things. Sometimes, by the way, and I don't know really what the spiritual status is of this, Sometimes I've actually preached the, the, the right biblical truth from the wrong text, uh, which, by the way, is really normal. I mean, that's the average Spurgeon sermon, is the right biblical truth from the wrong <laughs> text. And I'm really not sure what the spiritual status of that is, but I do know that, uh, and McShane would say, no, this is not a promise that can ever be something that we can say would be absolutely true of us, and here's why. Samuel was a prophet which meant every single word that he spoke to Israel, it actually tells you God said, you know, he's giving Samuel revelation. Samuel's a real prophet. Samuel's getting revelation direct. And so God gives Samuel his words, and then Samuel just conveys the words. Now, God's words are always accurate, and they're always fitting. And so none of Samuel's words ever fell to the ground. Some of ours are going to. Ah, but... The more you understand what the Bible says, and the more often you understand it and you express it fittingly, and that takes skill, and that takes knowledge, and that takes experience, and it takes practice, the more you will see your words not falling to the ground, because they are really God's words. I mean, you know, John Calvin um, comes awfully close, where he actually says, here's, here's a couple of great quotes. One place John Calvin, in his commentary, says that, uh, well, he says this in the Institutes. He says, God deigns to consecrate to himself the mouths and tongues of men in order that his voice may resound in them. And Calvin means by that, and later on he just says, we, we can be, actually be the very mouth of God. To the degree we understand the word and speak it wisely, to that degree we can actually say, in a sense, we are speaking God's words. It's always, you know, it's relative, it's not absolute, as the way it was with, with Samuel. Uh, Paul puts it like this, by the way, we do not distort the word of God. Now, I know this is a little weird because Paul is speaking as a, an apostle, but think of, I think this, this is really something that you and I ought to be able to say. We do not distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience. See? The word of God to the conscience, the word of God to the heart. In the sight of God, for we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness has made his light to shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now what, and what Paul's saying is, don't preach yourself as much as possible. Of course, it's always going to happen. You're going to. 
Don't preach your opinion. Don't preach yourself. Preach as accurately as possible, as fittingly as possible, the Word of God, and your words will not fall to the ground. You know, there's two practical implications, of course. Um, one of the practical implications, of course, is, is uh, study. <laughs> study well, because the, the better studied you are, to a great degree, being able to bring the Word of God to people accurately is a matter of study. You've got to study the Bible. You've got to know the Bible inside out, as we said. You've got to figure out how to read the Bible well, so you're not just reading yourself into it. We preach not ourselves. So on the one hand, I mean, it's a tremendous incentive to try to get the text right and not just, you know, speak about the first thing that comes into your head. Don't think of the Scripture as a, as a springboard or almost an excuse to say, oh, by the way, that reminds me of something I've always wanted to say anyway. But to say, this is what the Word of God says. So on the one hand, it's pressure. It's, it is pressure. It should be pressure to say, I want to get it right. I mean, it shouldn't debilitate you. And there is a danger, by the way, of theological education. Before you're theologically educated, you're a little bit blissfully uh, ignorant about, um, you say, oh, here's what, the, here's what the Bible says, but you just suddenly realize how easy it is to get wrong. I mean, you know, Kathy, my wife Kathy likes to say, the problem with being in med school, because we, we didn't go to med school, we have a lot of friends who did, is, is that once you realize all the things that actually go wrong with the human body, it makes you not want to get out of bed in the morning. You know, the rest of us just say, oh, you know, it's okay, but just all the things that could go wrong. And actually, the more theologically educated you are, the more you realize how, how many things you could say that are wrong about the text. So get it right and, and do your study. On the other hand, be confident. Because you will often say true, you will, you will often communicate the Bible truly and fittingly. And tremendous impact, astonishing impact. You will not, there's nothing, nothing, but now I'm speaking as a public speaker, and I don't expect everybody who gets theological education to be a public speaker. There's way more, there's far more ways than that to get the Word of God into somebody's life. But when people come and say, which happens all the time, actually, to speak, I think, to preachers who learn how to, you know, preach the Word of God, people come and say, I came, I came, uh, if you knew the problem that I was struggling with before I came today, you could not have spoken more directly to me. And I know you didn't know anything about it. How did that happen? And I, I cannot tell you. The words did not fall to the ground. They went in. Um, but here's the thing. When it does happen, it's, uh, you're going to feel like Stokowski. You know who Leopold Stokowski was? He was a uh, direct, well, he was a great director. Um, for a number of years, he was a director of the, uh, well, a number of different places. But there's a famous, there's a famous um, <coughs> story, true story, evidently, about Stokowski doing a, a rehearsal of, a, of a, a great orchestra. I forget which one it was. But anyway, he was rehearsing one of Beethoven's symphonies. And... Uh, you know, a good conductor can actually bring the very best out of an orchestra. I mean, there are some tremendous orchestras with tremendous talent, and, and yet they underperform because you have to get the right conductor. And evidently, he got up there, he spoke to them, uh, he, uh, you know, he stopped, of course, many times when he said, no, no, strings, you don't do that, no, no, woodwinds, you don't do that. And finally, when it was all done, he said, let's go all the way through it, and he went through it. And evidently, it was such an absolute astonishing performance. It was only rehearsal, but it was something, it was greater than, and I'm, by the way, I used to be a trumpet player for many years, and when you're inside an ensemble making music, and it's just astonishing to be, it's actually more astonishing to be in it. It's because you're not just out front listening with your ears, you, it kind of runs through your body, and um, evidently when it was all done, it was the best thing they'd ever actually performed. They realized he'd brought it out of them, and they jumped to their feet and started giving them a standing ovation. Uh, you know, this is the greatest thing, you're the greatest. It basically, you know, the standing ovation is just praised. And evidently, he just started, he burst into tears and he started waving his hands and trying to get them to sit down. And they finally all sat down and he looked at them, and they were men, by the way, this is why he said it the way, it was all men. <clears throat> he says, it wasn't me, men, 
it's not me, men, it's Beethoven. Which is just his way of saying, you know, instead of looking at me and saying, boy, what a great conductor you are, have you realized if it wasn't the music, it's the music. You just finally figured out what the music really was, you finally figured out what was on the page. You've played this for years and you never saw all that was in there. And I just helped you see it, but it wasn't me, it was Beethoven. That's essentially how every Christian minister feels. When you see people's lives change, and if anybody comes to you and says, you've changed my life, you, 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 know what you, you know what you say? Thanks. <laughs> That's what you say. Thank you very much. I'll pray for you. That's all you say. You don't want to say, you fool. <laughs> it's just the word of God. It's not me. It's Beethoven. It was there all the time. You just didn't see it. You know, and by the Spirit's help, you saw something that was always there. I was just, you know, I was just was a help. But that's the kind of possibility. So learn the Word of God and learn about the human heart. And uh, many of your words will not fall to the ground. Let me pray for a second before we move on here. Father, I just ask you that you'd, uh, so many people in this room, that you would help them because they're seeking to learn the Word of God. They want to use the Word of God in their lives and the lives of other people in various ways. Uh, they want to be able to do what Stokowski did, which is uh, unlock the power and riches in the Word of God so that they are uh, touching and changing the lives of the people around them. We yearn for that. We see so many people who need the power of the Word in their life. So equip us for that, to that end. Um, uh, help those of us who are trying to be instructors and, and professors and uh, mentors to help our brothers and sisters learn how to handle the Word of God and learn how to bring it home to hearts. Please help us do that. Please help us uh, become ministers of your Word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.